Right then. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this chat with Vlad and Don. Uh, Vlad uh, is has joined the Visual F Sharp team, or what we used to be called the F, Visual F Sharp team. Now we just call it sort of the F Sharp team at Microsoft. And uh, a few of you will know Vlad already. And Vlad has been super busy learning all about the F-sharp compiler, which has been great to see him working on this. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work on the testing infrastructure. We'll get to see some of that later on today. And uh, it's one of the, Microsoft is a really, really pleasant company to work at just lately. Uh, they've got some great initiatives going on. One of them is um, a big focus on uh, diversity and inclusion. And uh, it's, you know, it's it's uh, part of the ethos of the company is that we actually spend a lot more time talking to each other and a lot more time uh, learning from each other. And uh, with all of us online, this uh, is a lot easier than it used, used to be in many ways for me. And Vlad uh, and I have regular sessions and also with uh, one-on-one -on -one sessions and also with Will Smith, uh, who many of you will also know. And, uh, and we also have Philip Carter on, online, although he's not actually on the call. Uh, he's not, not presenting. Uh, and you'll know, some of you will know some of the other F-sharp contributors at Microsoft, like Kevin and Brett. And uh, so Vlad and I are having these regular sessions where we start to learn more about the F sharp compiler and we're going to do this in a fairly informal way. I see we've got 27 attendees, which is quite a lot and that's absolutely great. And uh, we as we were talking about this, we thought why not just make our chats open to the community and uh, we can use this as a as a sort of community based learning session and um, so we're open to topic suggestions. Vlad has been talking to the F Sharp community in Russia. So welcome to everybody from the F Sharp community in Russia. I unfortunately have no Russian. I would love to say hello to you in Russian. I absolutely love Russian culture and I, I spend a lot of time reading Russian literature and, and, uh, and learning about Russian history. And uh, so it's great to have, um, oh, uh, great to have you all uh, involved. Uh, Vlad s tells me there are something like a thousand people on the F sharp chat in, in Russia. Is that right, Vlad? Yeah, it's like uh, 1500, uh, like probably, probably even more. That is yeah, absolutely like folks. Fantastic. Yeah, like folks are like uh, really, really nice. And like, you know, the, the people are discussing different topics. Many of them are like really, really interested in a, you know, in depth stuff. Like uh, to learn Absolutely. about compiler optimizer. Yeah, yeah. I, I I may as well uh, share uh, one of the stories about one of the contributors, Russian contributors to .NET, whose name unfortunately escapes me. I have to go look it up. He is, I think, or at least was for a while working on the C sharp team, but back in around 2008 to two, 2007 2008. The .NET team, C Sharp team, started getting the most obscure and amazing bug reports from a Russian uh, .NET uh, contributor who uh, who lived in Norway, I believe, at the time, and uh, and they they just could not believe the quality of bug reports, and they asked him, "How do you find these bugs?" And he said, "Well, at the end of the working day, I get on the train to go home." And I imagine, my, imagine if I was going to implement this, what mistake would I make? <laughs> and he just searched for bugs using this very basic technique of saying, if I was doing it, what would I mess up? And sure enough, uh, these incredible bug reports came in and he did then continue on to work on the, uh, on, on the, on the C-sharp compiler and quality control on the C-sharp compiler and development as well. So, uh, there's a little anecdote for you from .NET history, and I will dig out the name later on. Uh, so, uh, yes, now, so format and topic for today. Uh, we are going to just do a very uh, quick uh, look at 
the F sharp compiler architecture since this is the first of these ones that we've done. So we will go to the .NET F sharp repo and I'm hoping you can see my screen as I go through this. I'll just check. Tell me if we've got any problems, please, Vlad, along the way. And, uh, and Vlad, since this is a chat between the two of us, you have to, your job is to make sure you ask lots of questions and also a relay any questions coming into the Q&A from the chat channel. Is that good, Vlad? Ah, uh, yeah, sounds good to me. All right, so uh, right, we now have a docs directory under .NET F Sharp, which we are actually going to start to work on and populate, and uh, it does have the compiler guide, uh, the compiler technical overview in it here. Now I have just submitted a pull request to fix something in that compiler guide, which is the image that uh, is being used. So I'm actually going to use the slightly updated version here uh, in the pull request, which is this compiler guide here. Okay, so let's. Uh, what we what we're going to do? Um, Vlad asked me to uh, say let's. Do the overview and then let's talk about fixing a bug. Uh, it's a bug that one someone in the Russian F sharp community uh, uh, opened uh, a couple of days ago, and we we won't. Uh, so this bug here uh, by Lennox, do we? Uh, Vladimir Sh uh, Shur. So I've got the pronunciation yeah. correct. Uh, let's just, here we go, uh, actually, how do we click through? Anyway, uh, here we are. Does that get us there? Yes, Vladimir, thank you Vladimir for this contribution. You are, you're in Belarus, big on my mind, at, on everyone's mind at the moment, and best wishes to everybody in Belarus, and you all know my opinion on what of things going on there if you follow me on, on Twitter. I have very strong opinions on that. Uh, OK, and thank you to all the Belarusian contributors and users of F Sharp over the years. I talked about that at a previous uh, Dugnad event, I think. And uh, so huge call out to everyone in Belarus who's contributed so much to the community over the years. And that's very ongoing as well. Glad to see that's ongoing. So uh, we're going to look at a bug and here. And here, let's take a glance at the bug. Empty array as default parameter doesn't work as expected. So uh, this is in a situation where you're actually dressing up an API for use from C Sharp. And you can uh, make, this is the decorations you have to put on to kind of give the C Sharp view of optional parameters and methods, which does differ from the F Sharp view. But we do support dressing up methods with, this, with these attributes. And uh, we support adding the attributes, and they are. Uh, we will take a look at this in a moment. And they are given special interpretation by the F# -sharp compiler, and they affect how code is generated. Now, the .NET IL for a um, for for uh, the code is is generated, and it turns out you can put this empty array here, and it turns out, according to the bug report, that this code compiles, but the parameter is not optional. And uh, you can't call it without parameters. And look at this. Now, this is the sort of thing we love in a bug report, a link to Sharp Lab. And uh, Sharp Lab, if you don't know it, is this wonderful um, C Sharp. Um, uh, so it's a wonderful tool, a web based tool, where you can put either C Sharp or F Sharp. We'll ignore the other one. And uh, you can. Uh, put some code here and you can choose you know, whether you like using release mode or not, choose what platforms you're running on, .NET Framework and so on. And you can create it just for the whole thing. And let's just, for instance, you can check the, uh, uh, normally you can fit assembly code here. Let's just correct this. So we actually put in a byte array here. This. Okay, you can actually see the assembly code over on the right and you can see how optimizations perform. Okay, so this is an incredibly useful tool. Obviously, this will be using a published version of the F Sharp compiler, 
Uh, it doesn't actually in this one tell you exactly which version of the F-sharp compiler is being used, but for checking out constructs that have been fairly stable, uh, you know, that uh, haven't been changing recently, this is an absolutely great way. And yes, please include links to um, to this kind of material. Uh, okay, and it does do the type checking as well, and you can see the, the overall result. And ah, now in this context, I guess what's important is you can also see the IL code that is generated here on the right. And we're all, I guess we're starting with the assumption that everybody knows about uh, the basic architecture of .NET in the sense you have your source language, you have the .NET IL uh, intermediary language, uh, a common IL, and then which is taken by the, the common language runtime and converted into uh, into into assembly code. Right, so uh, we okay. So Sharp Lab. So we have our, our repro, and all is good with this. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the compiler overview. I'm going to start with the diagram here. So these are the phases of the F Sharp compiler. Uh, now, let's and let's talk about them with respect to the 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 bug the bug. Okay. So when the and we'll start to map through to the uh, to the areas of the compiler. Okay. Okay. So here I have. Uh, opened the Visual Studio. My usual way of opening Visual Studio is to use the developer command prompt here. I actually always running in administrator mode because uh, I sometimes need to debug. And I just run devenv on visual f -sharp .solution. And that would be after, generally speaking, I would always do a build of the repo first, just with dot slash build. And I have previously done that, though I'll set it running just in case it hasn't done it already. It should just as it was hopefully run through that. Uh, unless I change, I'll just check if I've got any changes. I think I did. Uh, yes, I'll just do uh, git status and I'll just recheck out that file. And I'll do that build again here. Uh, OK, so uh, we have the parts of the compiler and nearly everything we care about is in initially is in one place, which is f -sharp .compiler private, And uh, it contains all the different phases of the compiler. And then there's as a library, F -sharp, which is very similar to fsharp.compiler.service as well. And in fact, that will also be here. So this same code, which is the majority of the compiler, and I'll just make sure we all know where that is. Uh, when we look in the compiler code base, so most of what we're looking at here is under source and under source F sharp, and it's this code which is the majority of the compiler. The view is slightly different over on the right. It's not an exact kind of correspondence in structure in that the same code is, uh, you'll see these are linked items here. The same code is being used both in F-sharp compiler.private and in F-sharp .service down here. Uh, and I'm actually going to, I wish I could put that away, there we go. I'm actually going to unload the F-sharp compiler service here. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk about the key. When, when I introduce people to the F -sharp compiler, the place I always start is in syntaxtree.fs. 
And it's a good it it is good because everybody who's used compilers who uh, knows something about compilers understands something about syntax trees. Uh, and it it is kind of one of these hinge data structures in the compiler. And in particular, when we take a look at the um, F sharp compiler guide, the, uh, the 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 result of parsing at this st stage here is the syntax tree. OK, so everything coming up through here comes out and you get the key data structure is the, the syntax tree. What comes before is all very much related to syntax and uh, breaking things into tokens. What comes after is very much related to the logic of the compiler. And what comes at the bottom is all very much related to the outputs of the compiler, bringing stuff actually through to .NET binaries and associated data formats. So, uh three di three very different modes of thinking in fact i guess f the colors in this diagram correspond to very different ways of kind of looking at the at the constructs and very different kind of uh, um, invariant supply along the way okay so let's take a look at the output of parsing and let's just take a random place usually you pick a random construct like um, uh, we can take a actually why don't we take um, try with is a good so a good one so we have a, a f sharp construct which is an expression like this this is the source code and then when that gets parsed you get to try with. And if you want to kind of follow, take the slice of the compiler that corresponds to that construct, then the perfect way of doing that is to search for, in this case, this is all part of a type, I should say. It's a part of a type called syntax, syn expression, syntax tree for F sharp expressions. And all of these types pretty much use require qualified access. So that means if we're looking to take the slice of the creation points and the elimination points, where is where are these try with nodes created and where are they consumed? OK, then we're taking the slice down this line of that construct OK, to get a kind of point of view on that. Then we can search for syn expression dot try with. And actually, you know, there aren't that many here. There are 19, which is not that many. And in fact, most of them aren't, aren't that complex. Uh, and you can see that the only place it's produced is actually in the in the parser. And that makes a lot of sense because we've got parsing and it's going to produce a try with node and then it's going to get consumed. So we can come along and look where this is produced and we, we, we start to learn about how parsing is specified in the F sharp compiler and this is a, 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 a yak uh, parser specification and it says if we have a try token and then we have some kind of expression and then we have some with clauses and you can continue on and break this down you can go and look for with clauses uh, just searching for that text back and forth uh, and you'll see well that might be a with and you go oh what's this o with and it turns out that o with is for the um, lightweight uh, the, the the indentation aware syntax so this this rule is for non indentation and this rule is for indentation aware syntax and it goes on and you know with pattern clauses and and so, and so on you can you can track through those so let me go back to the try with node so a typical kind of thing now uh, there's a very common thing in the F sharp compiler and it's actually a cause of an awful lot of bugs and that is the the idea that compilation has to be invertible okay that means whenever you go down these phases of the compiler you sort of have to be able to get back up to the top 
And, uh, and we don't do a great job on this. We didn't build the compiler initially with this in mind or with the testing of this in mind systematically. We kind of added it bit by bit as we realized we needed it. And of course you need that primarily for error reporting because you've got to be able to say this try with didn't make sense. Here we go, here's the exact error location. You need it for debugging. So you have to be able to put exactly the right, uh, the right. Um, so, so one of the things that comes out the bottom here, it's not shown, it's not just a binary, but you get a PDB file, a debug file, and uh, and you also need to be able to do it for language service work. So anything in the F# -sharp compiler service, which is building the IDE tooling, has to be able to get back to the exact source constructs in order to be able to give good error messages. And so an awful lot of the compiler logic is to do with ranges, and they're all called M because we used to call them marks. And you know, there's so many M's in the F# -sharp compiler that we can't really afford to go around and change all the M's to, to R, even though we use the word range. So everywhere you get a, uh, a everywhere you get an M, uh, uh, you will see uh, that it will be an instance of range here, which is a little struct. Uh, it's actually not so little. It's actually, I think, um, four. We can take a look. Let's take a look how big this baby is. Uh, it, it used to be little until we started realizing that people used very, very long lines and very long files with F sharp, and we had to make it a bit bigger. But it's two in 64s encoding uh, a start line, a start column, an end line, an end column, and a number for the file, uh, which is an index into a file uh, file table. Okay, so that's our uh, range markers, and you'll see them absolutely everywhere. You'll also see uh, this thing called SP all the way through the compiler. And if you're wondering, starting to, we can't go through all the abbreviations today, but in the F sharp compiler guide, there is a table of abbreviations and we will be updating this. And you'll see the M that I've listed here is a source code range marker. Uh, I think SP is not covered, but uh, SP actually means sequence points or debug points. Uh, and uh, again, we used to call them sequence points, but we actually changed the name of the types to be debug points to make sure because there's several. The word sometimes one of the problems in the compiler is the same word gets several different meanings. Okay, we use, for instance, uh, sequential computation, a sequence, a, a sequential expression for meaning an expression like uh, a, a comma b like that. Uh, but uh, we also talk about sequence expressions for sequence uh, like this and so on. And so we have to be a bit, bit careful about naming and sometimes there's the same terminology is kind of used. So we're trying to get better at that. And if you want to come along and help with kind of cleaning up code in the F sharp compiler, first of all, as we try to normalize things uh, to, you know, I spent a while, for instance, in certain places we were using type, uh, I'll, I'll just open a gist, I think, for this. Let me so I don't keep typing into that buffer. Uh, GitHub. Dot. I. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll type it here. So we, for instance, we had both TYP and TY all the way, way through the compiler. Or we go uh, is uh, is dog type is dog tip and is dog type. And we go through and we try and clean this up to be one thing. And we get rid of these these ones here and we try and use TY everywhere, for example. So even so clean up like that, that sort of normalizes and sister makes the compiler a healthier environment is welcome. The compiler is not by any means as consistent, anywhere near as consistent as we need it to be. So any if you could help us do that, that's absolutely great. Uh, but uh, don't do it in part, just do it over the whole code base for some particular aspect of systematizing the compiler. Uh, OK, so these are all ranges and sequence points, uh, and they are definitely related to each other, uh, but we we put in these information for ranges generally get used in error reporting. The sequence points we wrap in very in special types so that they get carried through unchanged all the way down to the 
emit of the actual debug symbols uh, or the preparation of the debug symbols. By wrapping them in their own type, we know that type is never removed, uh, never mucked with. We don't get, it's very hard to get those things wrong by, by, by putting them in their own part of the compiler data structure domain, <coughs> domain model. Okay, so this is, uh, this is where we are with dry with um, producing those things. Okay, so we can look at the consumption points and the, well, we look at the definition, uh, there's consumption points in syntax tree, such as grabbing the range out of one of these nodes. They're not very interesting. Uh, there are also some consumption points uh, for walking these uh, things, or we work out some things like, is it a control flow expression? Uh, in which case uh, it is true. It is, and that makes sense. And then there are the consumption points in the parser and the main consumption, sorry, in the type checker. And now let's just check where that fits in on our diagram back here. So we have parsing and it comes into, sure enough, type checking, which is first of all, we sequentially type check all the files. And along the way, we do pattern match compilation. And along the way, we do constraint solving. And then after the diagram is a little bit odd, this should be a single arrow, I guess, as we, yeah, so we sequentially run all of these steps. So we type check the file, we uh, compile all the pattern matching out, we solve all the constraints associated with the types and type inference. And then finally, we do a bunch of post inference checks and then we uh, run on to do the next phases. So coming out of parsing, we uh, come in here, and actually this is not the right one. This is, this is the main one here. And we run through, we, we check the various elements. So if we have try expression with uh, and then we get a set of clauses, so it might be try expression with, and this might be a set of clauses as in question mark uh, argument exception. Uh, I love this. I have switched over to US mode right here. Sorry. Yeah, no, there we are. argument exception as E goes to blah, 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 and you can. Um, uh, whatever, invalid op or something, operation, <coughs> and so on. Uh, okay, so these are collectively known as the clauses. And we'll get rid of those and just call them the clauses. And this is known as the sort of expression here. And we have the syntactic body expression. So we'll call that there. And we'll have the syntactic with clauses. And we'll pop that there. Okay, and we have some ranges. We have the range from the width to the last. So that's that range here. And we have a range from the try to the last. So we have the full range, the whole thing. We have a sequence point for the try, which is exactly, I believe, that token there. Because you, you can put a breakpoint exactly on that token. And we have a sequence points for the width, which is exactly that token there. And what do we do in the type checker? Well, we run through, we check the expression. We uh, actually, for technical reasons I won't go into now, we actually compile the whole pattern matching twice, uh, partly because we, in complex expression matches, we will first filter the exception and then we will catch the exception. Okay, so we've got uh, some, just checking the questions. So, okay, uh, okay, and so we um, we run through and prepare a set of clauses, but are for the filter. So we 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 do the filtering part, but we change all the bodies so that they all return one to say, hey, we caught the exception. So we run through and do that. And so you can see that we're injecting the syntactic expression here to return one. Uh, and that's fine. And we then we check those ones. We go check the match clauses. Then we check the whole thing, which is the handler clauses. 
then we compile the pattern matching. And so that is what we mean when we say that these fa these things are intertwined. So we take uh, the, the sequentially type checking calls across, sorry, calls across to pattern match compilation and back. Uh, well, it doesn't call back, it gets the results from pattern matching. And then we do that for the, ha for the handler clauses. And we then make the next data structure. So, and you look at this kind of thing, the thing that comes out of type checking is called the typed tree. We have the untyped tree or the syntax tree, which is coming out of parsing, and the typed tree, which is coming out of type checking. And so we can pop along and we can look at that typed tree. So we've taken a look at syntax tree and you might, you might say syntax trees sound fairly basic. Why is there so much of the compiler? If you look at all this stuff up here, uh, before we get to talk about syntax trees. And in truth, probably it could be lifted up a little bit, but you'll see that there are some common things across the compiler. For instance, the way that errors are reported, uh, and that means diagnostics from the compiler, that will be in the error logger, for example. Uh, and there are these other routines such as, there, such as a utilities, here, various data structures and things that we do use in the compiler. There is also a library here of general stuff that is kind of useful for bit manipulation and and sort of um, various bits and pieces for integer maps and so on. There's also a, another li general library of stuff, which is uh, in the uh, abstract IL library and uh, and that contains quite a lot of additions to the um, to the base library of that we're assuming in the compiler. So for an option here, lists and so on, uh, various functions that aren't in the fsharp.core library. OK. Uh, just as an aside while I'm looking at this, it is a goal, a long term goal for the F sharp compiler to be good F sharp code. And of course, good F sharp code should always have a triple slash uh, comment on on this. OK, so this would be. Um, uh, find I is actually I have to stop and think what this one is actually doing. Uh, it is, yeah, so it's an indexed find starting at N, uh, which is, and then it increases through to N plus one, and if it succeeds, it tells you that, and it's an odd function. I can't even work out why we would be using that function, but it's it's find the index of something and uh, and, the, and the value itself, the first thing, first place where F succeeds. Anyway, putting that aside, all I won't try and comment it now, but all of these things should have triple slash comments, and if you want to go through and uh, start to add triple slash comments into the F sharp compiler. We would be extremely well uh, glad to have your contributions along those lines. OK, uh, so back to the type checker. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was saying what was all this stuff before the uh, the parser and I was trying to explain what all that was. But so this is now dealing with the parse layer and we've uh, taken a look at the parser itself here. You've seen fragments of that. And we've taken a look at syntax tree. And then we've got down to the typed, yeah, the next layer down, which is the typed tree. And this is the typed tree here. And it is the second crucial data structure in the F sharp compiler. It's, it's as usual with these layers in the F sharp design methodology, a single file will often have an entire layer of data structure. And then you'll see after that, you'll see the, the, the things that like consume and produce that layer. So we've seen that up here, that this is the layer. This is the domain model for uh, the syntax tree layer of F sharp. And uh, you can just go through and read through syntax tree. Just read through it end to end. Uh, tidy it up, please. Make some contributions. Fix mistakes. Fix spelling mistakes and so on. Lay out mistakes if if you if you are reviewing that file. And uh, and then you have, as I said, the things that produce and consume that uh, output. Uh, now we're, we're talking about the typed tree. 
and uh, we were looking at the production of the um, the, the production of a typed tree node. And you'll often see this in the compiler. Again, it's kind of old fashioned F sharp slash O camel code. Uh, uh, coding styles MK means make uh, in this kind of universe. Uh, so it is, it's, oh, this has a triple slash comment on most simplex. Build a try with expression. Uh, so we can look at the definition of that. And it's taking all these various elements and it's building a typed tree node. So it's building an op node and the op node is a try catch. And actually for various reasons, it, it wraps the bodies in lambdas to indicate that they aren't immediately executed. And uh, these are the filters and these are the handlers. These are the sequence points for the construct and it puts all of those together into a, an operation node. So let's go take a look at that. Let's go take a look at expressions now in the uh, F sharp. Uh, in the, we are in typed tree here. So as I said, remember where we are. We are in the output of type checking. So the data structure that sits between these two layers, typed tree. Uh, it, we, we do document this in key data formats and representations. And we talk here about typed tree, typed abstract syntax tree. And you can see the links here. We talked, we've talked about syntax tree, and now we're talking about typed tree. Okay. So, uh, now in typed tree, one of the key data structures is expressions, like it was key in syntax trees. But there's quite a lot more information in these. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Look at Lambda. Lambda's just got quite a lot of stuff attached to it here. Uh, this is an application of a function, as in uh, taking a function and some arguments. And again, there's quite a lot of information about types attached to these things. Uh, we have let expressions, we have object expressions, and uh, pattern matching expressions, and so on. And one of them here is op expressions. So these are kind of, well, things that all have a lot of regularity. Uh, so we can take a look at what the different op nodes are. You can probably make pretty much everything an op node if you really wanted, but we kind of make a split between things that are really weird kind of expressions with, with which bind variables, for example, like a lambda. You know, a, a lambda expression or an object expression. They all they all deserve their own node, but none of these op nodes do that. They all they all work a little bit differently. Uh, so all of these op nodes have they're doing something to a bunch of other expressions. Uh, so if we look at these op nodes, they've got the operation. Then the operation takes a bunch of type arguments and a related arguments, and it's got a range as to the source code location for that. And so one of the things you might do is, for instance, have a tuple and you'll have a bunch of info and that'll have a set of types. The types of the elements of the tuple and a bunch of expressions, which are the elements of the tuple. That, re that operation represents creation of a tuple value. And it'll have some info on it. So let's take a look at that. And just for just to randomly dive into uh, something here, tuple info. And it's actually a, it's actually a constant. Two info is actually saying whether the thing is a struct or not. Okay, and it turns out uh, it's just a boolean saying is it a struct or not. Okay, is it a struct tuple or not? Okay, so one of the operations was a try uh, catch. Probably should be called try with because that's what we call it in the F sharp compiler, and that should probably be renamed to be try with, and that would be a good first pull request to anybody who wants to send that in. Maybe before the end of this call, someone will send in uh, a rename of try catch to try with to be more regular. And uh, it has two associated bits of information, plus it has its arguments, and those arguments were the, were the body of that thing that we saw being created back here. Okay, make try with, there we go. And then back in the type checker was where we were making that type, uh, that uh, node, and we were continuing on. 
Now, checking of expressions does have this TP environment, uh, which is one of the abbreviations. So let's go take a look at what that is. And it is a type parameter environment, environment tracks the type parameters in scope during type checking. So you'll see that threaded all the way through of type checking. It comes into the function that we're in and it comes out and you'll see it got threaded through TPN, TPN here all the way through, got consumed, produced, consumed here, produced here, consumed here, produced here, and finally returned here. Okay, <clears throat> right. And right, so we then make the try with node and then later on we will go and actually emit the code for that. Okay, so now that was just taking a slice through the compiler. Okay, so now let's, um, Talk. I think that's enough compiler overview for today because we can we will get to the other parts shortly. Uh, and we're going to take a look at this bug. And we are going to do that by looking at the bug. And we're going to say, OK, right. So the F sharp compiler seems to need to know something special about default parameter value. It is seems like it's a special thing to the compiler. So what one of the most important tools in the compiler is simply a global search through the compiler code, uh, especially the source directory, SRC directory. It's a reminder that's this F sharp source directory here but particularly the F sharp directory under there. So, and you might, uh, yes, I have, I do have match, I'll put match case on, but I will not search for the whole word. Uh, you might turn that on and off, but there's a reason for that, which is that I happen to know that as most.NET programmers will know, that this thing actually has the implicit word attribute afterwards, like all that is optional attribute. You just don't have to keep writing it in the attributes here. So there is an, an attribute after. So we can see that on this line, for example, here. So uh, let's actually search for that to, to narrow things down a bit. And we can see it will ignore the tests down below and we'll see we've only got four places where this is being uh, being mentioned. OK, so there aren't. I mean, it could be that we're missing one of these things that we need to. Uh, uh, we need to. Add something, but actually it is mentioned, so let's dig into that. Let's look at the. Let's look at this one first. Now this is because this is the one of the ones that doesn't matter. This is TC Globals and this is all all the special things that the compiler knows about. OK, and you can you can look through these and you can see, OK, actually it's not too surprising that the compiler knows about the exception type EXN or that it knows about the array, array types make system non generic type. Uh, or that it knows about runtime type helpers and so on. These aren't that surprising. It's a good place to learn about the compiler and learn about the kind of wacky corner case things. The, the, the thing that we're looking at is a fairly wacky corner case thing. Nobody, very few people have to write this kind of code. It's only if you're interoperate, dressing something up to interoperate from C sharp, uh, which isn't that common and is. Uh, so this is one of these corner case things and it's worth going through and you go you might say to yourself i didn't know that f sharp gave a damn about marshall byref objects or some of these date from dotnet framework uh, days they're no longer present in dotnet core but the compiler still runs on dotnet framework um or can generate dotnet framework code um so you can just go through and do searches for those if you like so you can actually look uh any of these saying i didn't know it knew, it knew about uh, async callback or something and go and go through and and check for where that is used in the f sharp compiler and there is a fair fair number of these things some uh, always too many but always not enough uh for correctness so we do have this thing here this is where that special known thing is is declared and you can say that this thing here is a built-in attribute info option. 
And it's an option because it might not actually be present in the .NET Framework libraries we are referencing in the compilation. So you can track through how we work that out here. So we try to find a system attribute. We do that by splitting the name. We try to find a system uh, type uh, compilation unit which has that type name. So we actually search all the all the reference assemblies for which uh, which one contains this type because the .NET framework keeps kind of being rejigged and reorganized into different kind of different kind of um, assemblies and uh, you know with .NET Core and .NET Framework and so on. So we just go searching through all of them and it's, it's, it's quite quick. It happens at compiler startup. It's not a, not a big deal. OK. Uh, so try find system attribute and I was looking at this and that's what this big table TC Globals is. OK. Uh, now it is also mentioned in uh, infos and it is getting the parameter attributes of a method info. And infos is a key part of the typed tree logic. It's actually listed here under logic. It should really be part of typed tree. It's the nodes aren't actually in type tree, but it is intrinsic, very intrinsic uh, extra data structures to do with calling uh methods and yeah preparing method calls you know what information we have we got about a method we are going to call and this thing is what is going to be used to work out where as we are calling one of these methods to work out that the attribute is present so if we go back to sharp lab here And we uh, we have the um, uh, let's say this is the case where this was actually a null default C sharp default parameter value. Then the call succeeds. Okay, that means this compilation succeeds, and we get corresponding uh, .NET IL coming out at the end. And that is because that's a good default parameter value and everything is good. Now when this call was being processed, it creates an info for this node, a meth info for this node, and the, the type checker is going to need to ask, tell me about the arguments. Tell me about, the, and there's one argument here, tell me about the parameters. What do we know about them? And it is going to go through and look and then it's going to say, oh, it's optional. Oh, it's got a default value. Okay. That is the that so it's in the processing of this node that we get the uh, that we get the use of that default parameter value information. OK. Right. Now uh, the other place it gets used, so that was no surprise. The other place is in emitting ILX gen. OK, so this is a uh, compilation list. This is at the bottom down here, which is in uh, code generation. I think there really should be, I guess it, yeah, here, code generation, ILX gen. And there's this thing that takes the typed tree, the optimized type tree, and bang, we get down to emitted binary. Okay. So that's what this is. We're generating different parts of the binary. So we looked at expressions before. Actually, why don't we look at gen try uh with actually gen try catch here this is where for instance we generate a try catch node uh we this is our top one here and this is where we go through and we generate the il constructs here we have things like if generate filter blocks and etc etc we generate all those elements but we uh just orient ourselves with that slice of the compiler. But we're at a different point where we're generating these default parameter value attributes. And now it turns out that we go we go through and we think, OK, we've got a case where the uh, default parameter value is an array. Hmm, let's see what happens with that case. Why is that behaving differently to if it is null? So let's go through and look at that. And, it's, and so, uh, so we're generating the attributes for the parameters and it runs along and it says, hmm, uh, 
is there? Try and find us an attribute on this parameter, which is the default parameter value. Well, we, we would expect this to succeed. This thing returns an attribute option. You can see it at the end of the type there. And it is going to return some in both, in both whether it's null or an array, okay? And then we're going to go through and try and do find field init for default parameter value attribute. Hmm, let's take a look at that. That's here. So that's in infos where we were. And it's going to look through the look through the attribute and it's going to say value of default parameter attribute. So it's going to get the value out, which is going to be an expression. So we're going to get uh, uh, we could. Well, it's actually up here. OK, it's taking the attribute and it uh, gets apart the, the the very first expression because it's, uh, it's only got one. These are the expressions in the attribute, which is where are we? this expression here, just to put this in the gist so it's not quite so cramped. We are at the point where we're just looking at this attribute here. So I'm gonna just drop that byte array off. It is a type annotation is needed, but we're just gonna look at this attribute here and it's got an expression which is an array, empty array expression here. Let's put a bit more spacing in. Okay, so empty array expression. Okay, so it's going to be an attribute and it's got so, and you can look at the various nodes of that in the documentation for attribute. And it's going to have some expressions and it's going to get the very first one of those expressions because it's actually going to have one and it's going to be the default value and it's going to check whether it is a constant or not and return that okay so so uh so it's not so we're going to go down this path because this thing is not a constant it's an empty array and those things are different and we can you could look at uh how would you determine that it is something uh what if, if if someone's actually wants to build a, an interesting tool for the f -sharp compiler it would be there are certain, some of this is available in the phantomus tooling but it'd be where you can just type in an expression into a window so you could type in something uh, like this uh, with a uh, with a uh, type annotation by the way like this and you could just put that into a, a, a web window sort of f -sharp lab or something and type this in and you could see not only the IL, but wouldn't it be nice if there was a typed tree? You know, you, so there's, oh, actually, there, oh, there's a syntax tree. That's actually cool. Sharp Lab actually has that feature. Wow, that's fantastic. That's for the syntax tree. It doesn't actually show the typed tree either, uh, which is a, a little bit harder to, uh, to get access to. Uh, but uh, it is possible to get a, a variation on the typed tree from the F-Shop compiler services. Okay back and yes yeah, so we are actually going to go down the none case for this baby here and but let's also say even if we did return something uh let's take a look at what we might produce for it so we'll go to constant il field in it uh look at this here this is an active pattern here and this takes various expression constants and corresponds them so these are the things for instance if you have uh, a if you had like the number zero or 0 0.1 in in an attribute then this is gradually working out what is the dotnet il representation of that of those constants that you can have in attributes and uh in here, it matches a constant with all the different cases and produces the corresponding IL field in it. And now we ask ourselves at the moment, what would we actually produce for an empty array? We're saying, oh, so are you even allowed to have, well, you're allowed to have arrays in attributes, but are you actually allowed to have arrays in default parameter values in the .NET IL, which come down to these .NET, to these IL field units. And so what well, we might say, well, I don't really know. Okay, so why don't we look at IL field .NET? And one of the good things about these .NET IL types, the abstract IL types, 
is that they are a pretty much a complete representation of .NET IL. And, uh, and it turns out there's no case for arrays here. So my understanding is you are not actually allowed to have an array in this position. That there's no C sharp syntax to generate. C sharp doesn't use this syntax, right? So there's no C sharp syntax to actually specify an array as the default value. Okay. So that so so that means we have to reconsider this bug. We have to think, okay, if arrays aren't going to be allowed in this position, then what is the status of that in the F sharp language? And this is a point where you might come back and come with a question to me or to the community. You know, should this be allowed or not? And uh, there may be some uh, discussion down here. In fact, you know, I think it should raise error. This is not a valid custom expression. It, it suggests the error number, and this is all this is all the right analysis. Okay. So uh, the question is now where and how would we raise that error if there is no uh, no proper value? So let me come back here. So one now we could raise it here, but this is an optional thing. So really returning none from here does actually feel right. And this isn't really a method. This method isn't really set up to report errors. So uh, instead, we might go back to ILXGen and we might consider reporting the error in ILXGen. And to be honest, for most people contributing to the F-Sharp compiler first time, this is a natural place to do it. And the code would begin to look something like this. You might make these matches explicit. Uh, it can be easier to do that sometimes. Uh, so if there's no, nothing, then we return nothing. I, I'm going to write it out explicitly uh, here. So if there's some attribute, then we would uh, we would match the thing here, match uh, that on the attribute with uh, if there is some uh, v, v, then we can return some V. Now, if there's a none, that is, there's no field in it for the default parameter for value, then that's an error, isn't it? The attribute is there, but the field in it is not there. And so in this case, we want to re uh, report an error, report a, a warning or error. Now, let's say which whether to report a warning or error is something we have to decide as a community according to the, um, the, the, the rules of, of, of the game. Uh, about backwards compatibility. And let's just say for a moment we decide to make this an error because it's, yeah, I mean, it's not working at the moment. We may as well report it as an error, uh, is it one reasonable analysis. So the way, of course, you report an error is just to find somewhere else that reports an error and copy that code across and then make appropriate changes. So uh, the errors are all in this FS comp. Okay, which is here. And you always just add new errors at the end. And uh, we actually, I, yeah, I just chuck it on as the next reported error message number here. And you will just copy the, this error message. We'll search for this one, just, just to copy it down into here. Uh, sorry, okay, 3391. Hmm, what are we going to say? We'll call this IL um, invalid field init, uh, invalid default parameter value. Uh, value. Now, there was a suggestion in the bug that we already have an error message 267. This is not a valid constant. Yeah. That's, that's a reasonable one, actually. So let's just take a uh, two, six, seven. Sorry, looking through FS comp. Uh, two, six, seven is here. Not a constant expression. It is being produced from a different phase of the compiler. That's in TST. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So for the moment, I will just add a new error here 
with a bit more explicit, uh, and we'll call it IL invalid default parameter value. value. And we'll say something like this. Uh, this is not a valid default parameter value. It's okay. And we would take that as the uh, save that file. And we would, where were we down here? We will pop that in. Now, one of the joys of working on the F-sharp compiler is, uh, let's check here. So, oh, we are, have to actually return a value here, which would be nub. Okay. And all right. So now, one of the joys of working on the compiler is that FS changes to FS comp won't uh, immediately reflect in the IDE. So you actually need to set a, a build going to get those kind of updated uh, here, and that will eventually flow through. So we can ignore this red squiggly uh, for, an, okay. But we can't ignore this one, it says, because we haven't got a range. And the usual thing if you haven't got a range is to say, you know, that means we don't know where to, what source construct, what in, in that thing about inverting the compilation process back to the source code. We don't know what, what uh, where we are, okay? So we can just add a parameter and then you go looking for the call sites here. And usually there'll be a relative uh, a range. We can check these, uh, but uh, we, there, there might be multiple ranges that are possibly relevant to this, but usually most routines in the compiler, if you go up a couple of levels, have, have a range available. Uh, here's another place where we generate parameter attributes and I will put uh, a range parameter there. And you can see we do have a range parameter coming in here, but one of the things in code review in particular is to check we're using the right ranges. Okay, and we now have M available. Another thing about the F-sharp compiler that's a little bit irritating at the moment is we actually do two builds of the compiler, .NET 4.7.2 and .NET Standard 2.0. That means these errors in the error window are, is we've already cleared the error for 472, but it takes the compiler quite, a, that's the IDE, quite a long time to catch up before it will clear the error for net standard. We're, we're working out what to do about this. It is a major pro problem with productivity in working on the compiler. You can see it is now cleared off, uh, but it does take quite a long time to clear those off, unfortunately. So, uh, okay, and as I said, this one, this one will need uh, to keep doing the build until it succeeds, and this one will eventually go through. Oh, I said partly it's because I'm in release mode and I'm building down here in debug mode. So I'll switch that back across. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about testing the compiler. Now the first thing you'll want to do is probably, you know, uh, assuming you're not kind of doing TDD kind of uh, test-driven development, you probably just want to run the compiler. And for something like this, I personally just go through and uh, run the compiler by hand. And I will admit I'm a little bit old-fashioned and I run the .NET framework version of the compiler which uh, will eventually come through once it gets built. But I will just run fsc.exe here. Uh, it hasn't been built yet. Um, yeah, so this is the old, the compiler build has not yet finished. Um, and so in order to do my personal testing, I will just create a code file. Uh, uh, I just usually call it a.fs. And there's an old, an old code file from something I was working on, and I'll just create a code file uh, for the repro normally for something that's nice and simple. Uh, except we're going to have to open some namespaces to get this out. Uh, and which namespaces do we need? We need system runtime interrupt services. Open that up. And we'll just test whether that's working or not. Now this is the still the old compiler. The compiler is not yet built, so we would expect that compilation to succeed. And um, 
all going well, once we once it's once the compiler build is done, we will build and we will now get an error for that uh, compilation. Right, and you haven't asked any questions. I've been talking, talking, talking. Let's do let's do um, questions now. Yeah, uh, let me let me ask a few questions from the from the chat. Yep. Um, so, like two questions uh, related to the compiler. Um, so, is there is there a uh, purpose or like is there a reason behind you know, those single letter and obfuscated names and arguments uh, everywhere in compiler or, or just you know historical reasons? Uh, so. Some of the some of the abbreviations are, are fairly reasonable. The M abbreviation works fairly well most of the time, except of course when we have multiple M's in scope, in which we have to start being more uh, clever. Uh, many of the abbreviations I don't particularly enjoy having them in there, and it is I guess it's a uh, it's a heritage from the OCaml way of coding, and a lot of it is not particularly good F sharp code by F sharp coding standards, and we would like to change these. Uh, some of them. Yeah, so for instance, I don't like. The use of E. Here, G is OK. G is this kind of glo TC Global's value. You, you, you never have multiple G in scope. So actually writing TC Global's everywhere would actually really kind of blow out a lot of things. So actually just having a G for Global's is, is not too bad. Uh, the, yeah, so I guess, is there a, you know, it shouldn't be so cryptic as it is. Yeah. So there, we are trying to improve that. We'd love your help in trying to improve that. Uh, continuing, if for instance you come across abbreviations or your naming patterns that aren't, that are inconsistent, we'd love to, especially if they're inconsistent within one file, we'd love to get rid of that. Uh, if they're inconsistent across the code base, we'd love to get rid of that. So, um, yeah, so it's a, to answer the question, some of it is heritage, some of it is sloppy coding. Great. And uh, uh, like second, uh, there's a second question, like I'm not sure, uh, it's slightly related to the, to the first one. Um, people people asking like why there's not that many you know type annotations in, in the compiler. I know that there are like you know FSI files alongside with the with the source code, but uh, you know people were wondering like why uh, you know there's not, not not that many annotations, for example, like uh, on the, the non-public yeah. functions, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So why? Yeah. Okay. Um... So what's our expectation about where we would like to be with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So I would love to be at a point if we look at, say, the signature. I'd love to be at a point where everything has a signature file. Everything in the signature file is always triple slash uh, documented. Uh, so, for instance, there are three. There are some examples that are not done there. I like it to be much more consistent about casing. You know, they're, 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 you know, either this gets made into an interface, or we switch to the more consistent casing. Uh, I would like it that signature files always have named parameters here. OK, these are unnamed positional parameters here. And you know, there are two attributes here. They should all systematically have naming added for all of them. Um, OK, so that's signature files across. For, OK, so. Uh, I have no 
problem. I do have a bit of a problem with fully annotating all implementation code, including all top level things. I do think that that doesn't end up in a happy place. Gen params here takes a whole bunch of things. Some of them are type, uh, type annotated, some of them not. I don't. I personally am kind of comfortable with only annotating what's necessary, but you know, in, in the sense, this is up much more up to the community now than it is up to me. We have what we have. It's not. It's th there's there's a transition that was well, uh, going to be long and ongoing between a, effectively a compiler that was started by myself worked on by many people and through to one that is worked on by many people, people not that familiar with the, the, the code base. And so I'm quite happy to be trending more and more to making more things explicit, putting in more white space, putting in more triple slash comments and just strongly moving in that direction. And I'd really encourage the community to help do that, not by by doing that in separate pull requests that improve the quality of the code. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's sloppiness in the code, for instance, this M value should not be capitalized. Uh, it, that, that, that I, I have no idea how that got into the code base. OK. Uh, and also, you see that we gradually do put more uh, spacing in. Be quite happy to see a double slash comment in here about what this is doing. Uh, it's it's quite reasonable for any any block which is five lines long to have a bit of expl explanation about what we're actually generating. Great. Yeah. We might please submit more questions. We'll continue on for another fifteen minutes. I think it's been a good start, uh, and we will now run the compiler here. OK, good. So we get a new error message. This is not a valid default parameter value. And uh, that is great. And then to add the test. Now, adding tests has now become way simpler thanks to Vlad's work. And the place generally to add tests about the compiler will be in F sharp compiler component tests here. We might rename this, but it's called what it is for now. And uh, you might come along to language and honestly just add a new file under language. It, it, it you, you can do it under error messages. I guess we would do that. We would add a new file here or add a, uh, which would be, I, I won't actually go through and add the error message in here, but you would come along to look at one of the existing things. And let's see, actually I'll look at one that's a bit smaller uh, here like this. I'll actually just sort of add the test in here. So we'll copy the test across warn uh, error on bad parameter attribute like this we copy our code usually taken from our test case here into here and we should fail and actually we expect the diagnostics uh, it contains the full range information here this is the start position and the end position we only got the start position here, 514. And uh, so we would expect that to be starting on line 514. If we want to get the full information, there's a flag VS errors, which we can uh, run here. That gives us both the full range information to 515. 515 here. And we get the text of the error message and the number 3391 is here, get that. And we can update that. <coughs> the tests have been built. Uh, this is the name of the test, so we search Test Explorer to only contain that once, oh, it is, Deciding to do quite a lot of build again. I must have changed some code along the way. So uh, we'll, we'll get another build. We can take some more questions while that build goes through. Um, all right. Um, Here's, yeah. Um, 
there's there's one question quite interesting one like um, what kind uh, of a, uh, sorry uh, uh, I, I I keep losing you down can you can you hear me I can hear you, yes yep. oh great so um, like questions related to the optimizations in in uh, in F sharp uh, so what are or what kind of optimizations are uh, specific yes, to, that, to F sharp that, that that was going to be our second topic for the day. Uh, we, uh, but do, but I think we are going to run out of that time for that, and we will do optimizations in the next session. There is a section in the compiler guide on code optimizations that, are, and it, they, it, it talks about the four files that have code optimizations. And it talks about what in particular optimizer.fs does and it runs through what dtuple does, runs through what inner lambdas to top funks does, and what lower calls and sequence does down here. It uses some technical uh, language like eater expansion and so on. You might not know what those terms are. And I, uh, but generally it, this section should be fairly familiar to people. So for instance, if something is a constant, it's known to be a constant, that, then that will be propagated through the code. Uh, if, if X is known to be equal to Y, let X equal Y, then it will replace use of X by Y. And uh, it, uh, it knows, it propagates tuples of constants and records of constants and union cases of constants and so on. Uh, but we will do a separate session on that, and we will probably do that focusing mostly on optimizer.fs. Uh, the, um, the other phases um, are not that interesting. These are actually kind of, they're stable optimizations, which we kind of won't be touching. Uh, we won't be extending them, we won't be touching them, but we also won't be taking them out, okay? Uh, they are what they are, and they do some good work, but they're not not—they're not that important to know about, and the code is not that well written in a way. It's quite hard to follow. Uh, the optimizer is the place we will spend most of the time looking at, I think. And we'll take a brief look at how state machines are done in lower calls and seek seeks. Okay, now all going well. We've done the build here. We didn't get any fails. We didn't search any errors. Hmm. Let's go on there. Uh, Oh. Huh. So. Sure. Why the component tests aren't showing here, Vlad? I. Let's see. So. Did rebuild right because I, uh, I did do a build here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I it could be because I did that change from release to debug and something got confused. I will. Uh, okay. Well, if the test doesn't show in this, I would try restarting Visual Studio. I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll do that now. Unfortunately, that sort of thing is necessary. And if given what I've done so far, if I was having trouble rerunning the test, honestly, I would just throw it at as a pull request at the CI system and see what see what comes uh, uh, and then adjust the error message and its results. You know, it's only that one test case that we've added. So it's not too hard just to get the CI system to run the tests for us. Um, right. For that particular tooling problem, um, there was a little yellow bar at the top that said you needed to reload a project. It's I likely see. because you had some kind of project file that was edited and something got into a kind of state that it needed to reload the project and 
um, recognizing the stuff in the test explorer was probably a uh, consequence of not reloading. That so it was it was a, it was a, ca a casualty of that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, reloading the edge should probably have kind of the same effect. Of yeah, I, I, I could have. I, I I did wonder that. Just I should have pressed that thing at the top. Yep, that makes sense. Right. Uh, Okay, there's one other topic I want to mention to do with the compiler, which is the the, the fix we made uh, is a little bit imperfect. I think it would actually do, but th there's a slight problem with this fix, and that is that it is running error is being reported during IL code generation, not late in the compiler. compiler. And uh, if we look at this, um, compiler map here, then there's an important distinction, which is that the first four phases, and in fact this quotation translation as well, but not optimization, the first four phases get run in the IDE, but the last phases do not as you're typing your code. Okay, it's all the way, it's run, rerunning again and again, the type checker uh, and the lexium parsing. So that means any errors which are reported down here do not show up as red squigglies in the IDE. And the and the, what you have to do is to take that check that we had in IL, IL emit and do it earlier. And you can think, well, where will we do that check? OK, well, you could do it. Uh, um, you know, where, where do we do that check? Well, we could probably do it in these post inference checks as we check the individual at attributes on a parameter. And the way we would do that would be to come to ILXGen and to take this value, this code here, roughly speaking, uh, which is uh, cracking these attributes. And we would come in at post inference checks here. And we would check, uh, for instance, then we would look for check attributes here. And to be honest, we can probably, uh, if uh, well, there's a flag here, if we're reporting errors, we could probably just chuck in a variation on this check under here. Uh, we can tab this baby in, correctly space that code. Uh, we have the attributes. We need a jeep, which will be, we usually comes from the cn at the top. Uh, g equals cm dot g here, extract that out. And if there's no default parameter value there, then we do that. If there's some, uh, if it can be translated, we do that. Otherwise, we report an error. I can tidy up this code a little bit, quite likely, but that would oh we need a, a range value here so again we don't have a range on the individual attribute uh so oh it does actually the attributes do have a range at the end uh so uh, we actually want to here now Okay, so I will write this out like this because it's here. Uh, like that. Uh, as that troop, like that. You take off the TC ref here. And now we have our range here. And if we make this change, we will now get the error being reported in the IDE. Now, you might say, how can I put that under test? OK, and in fact, that is something I can talk with Vlad about because there should really be an option here which is kind of type checked only. OK, because this this actually maybe that is actually right. Does type check only does the type checking phase after that? That's an interesting thing that our test may have actually failed because Check of this. It says type check F sharp. Yes, it doesn't actually produce the code. No, no, it doesn't. OK, so our test would have actually failed because we weren't doing it at the right phase, which is actually a good thing. Uh, and it would have forced us to come up here and put in this and things will go a lot better. There's one other thing I want to mention here, 
is I'm extracting this range out of the attrib value here. Let's take a look at the attrib here, attrib here. You know, it's probably sensible to put a range member on this thing. Uh, these single case unions are often used as sort of record like things. They're quite convenient in the compiler, but uh, they, they, they're gradually becoming more and more like objects or records. So now that gets the range out of the thing. And that creates quite a lot nicer code because we can just do attrib here and we can do uh, attrib dot range. And that will look quite nice because we have the individual range for the attribute. And that means when we do our, our uh, in our code, where are we in sharp lab or something here, then we will get the error on exactly that error location there. So exactly that from there to there. OK. Um, just saying that if you add something like this, remember to put the triple slash uh, range of the attribute. This covers uh, this covers both the uh, attribute name and its arguments. Double check that in the parser as the attribute is being uh, generated. So we go to the parser and we search for attribute attribute. Actually, this is, we'd have to trace back a little bit. We have to trace in the type checker where these, this is the type tree, where attribute, attribute is produced in the type tree. Then we go back and check where it's check, created in the parser. Just double check it. It, uh, it is, it is I'm, I'm fairly certain correct, but you would go through and at least as part of code review, uh, check it. And if, you, you, if you're not sure, then you can put a, um, you know, uh, to do explain explain exactly what is covered and what is covered and we can talk about it in the repo uh okay a, a good comment will be carry that information um okay and secondly you would go through and check for places where this is actually useful so if we search for attrib uh and uh, and you see all its occurrences here then for for instance, let's see, range. So here's one, for example. So you would then go through and simplify the code. If you're going to do an improvement and you, in the same pull request, you would actually apply the simplification. Take the attrib and make this attrib.range. It's going to, it's a nicer code. Okay. And you'd go through and do that systematically in the code base, just as part of cleaning up. Now I I did the search by searching for attrib question mark. You can also use find try and use find all symbols. Find all symbols across the code base is, of course, it's a big code base. Visual Studio needs to type check everything. It can, and it, because of that thing about doing two versions of the type checking, it takes a long time. It's actually just better to do uh, to to do, generally speaking, to do textual search across the code base. Uh, and yeah, it, it's a little bit clumsy, but you have to, it, it's okay to do that. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So that's a sort of incremental improvements to things like typed tree. Let's say, well, I'll go back to where we were. Sorry, dot range. Where was it? Here. Yeah. Okay. So that's incremental improvements of these data structures uh, in here. And for example, the, the, actually just spotting another another thing that we can change. Uh, yeah, these things can be given names as well in uh, in 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 the code, uh, and that is a good thing to do. Uh, args arguments. Make, you can make them more explicit like this. Uh, we probably just keep the we generally attribute arguments. In fact, probably just arguments and named arguments is fine. And you'd go through and discover what this Boolean flag is and uh, see if we can find what that thing is. It is. Aha, uh -huh. 
That's the is applied to getter or setter. Okay, that's this. If you apply an attribute to a property, then you have to work out whether it's applied to the property or not. And we'll put targets and we'll put range like that. Okay, now the reason why you do that kind of improvement to the code base is because uh, debugging becomes much nicer. When you see an attribute value in the debugger, you'll get nice results. So if you're going to launch the debugger, I personally uh, do it from for working on small examples of F-sharp code like a.fs here. I nearly always do it with regard to the command line like this. Okay. De from an administrator prompt, start devn slash debug exe. Now this is using Visual Studio. You can also use a VS Code debugger. I don't know how to do the equivalent in VS Code. Maybe someone can explain. Uh, and then you can launch the compiler. If you want to do the net core app of the compiler, uh, my understanding is here, you can do this on .net uh, .exe like this. And you can just run those directly uh, as well. Okay. And okay. Right. Uh, saving here. That's the old error, if I got that right. Uh, we build in the compiler. And uh, our component tests are now showing here. So this okay. Here is our new test that we've added here, and once the build is done, we can go and make that um, run that test. Okay, more questions? Actually, there are there are a bunch. Um, okay, great. Let's take those. Yeah, so one of the questions is um, like when when people coming you know across the different bugs uh, like which are difficult to reproduce, how like what what can can be done better to you know re report it on on a GitHub like uh, you know do we do like I guess we 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 want like some minimal uh, uh, like minimal thing which we can you know. Reproduce them like solution or project file with, with a description and environment, right? Do, do you have any 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 hints about like yeah, how, I, how I, to better report bugs for for Sharp compiler? I, okay, so there's two other two questions. Then how can we get better information and how can we begin to track the source of this down? Um, right. So absolutely a minimal repro and a cut and paste repro is just so useful. Like I mean, this was a great bug report and it's the. Uh, Without any doubt, uh, this one here. But you know, this one didn't have the open uh, line in the top of the repo. So you, you know, I, whoever's doing it has to go and uh, and uh, put that in. So in fact, I will go and improve the bug report just that tiny bit. It's uh, by actually editing that in. So next time, I don't have to, or whoever's doing it doesn't have to, doesn't have to do this. Uh, so it, if there's um, obviously, if the repo is yeah, lift it out to be just a compiler invocation, then that is great. In the context of what Cody uh, talked about, uh, which was, if I've got rightly, it was uh, using a computational expression from a library of mine, the fix was to put the code inside a module, is using a top level module. That is, okay. Uh, okay, well, you you would show the two, minimal version of the two variations on the code with as many variables eliminated as possible, like down to absolute minimum. Uh, as for where you could track that down, I think I would have to see the actual bug report. Um, the, yeah, that is, Tricky. I, I, I think I'd have to actually see the bug report on that. Yeah. Um, having a solution or project is extremely useful. You can just cut and you can just clean your project, your minimal repo, make a zip of it and paste it into GitHub. GitHub does support pasting of zips and it gives you a link for them. Uh, so that's super, super helpful. Um, 
obviously with as few libraries as possible. Uh, you know, as few reference packages as possible, just keep trimming down stuff again and again and again. There are an, quite a surprising number of F-sharp bugs come down to like five, th five lines of code or less. So uh, usually we can get it down to that. Okay. Okay, so someone asks, is it hard to add IDE VS support for FS LAX and FS YAC? At least highlighting. Um, personally, I see FS Lex and Yak as a means to an end in that I am no longer really fundamentally um, an advocate of those tools. And they're fine tools for what we need them to be, but I don't, they, they you know, or, or, or there's levels of advocacy. We use it in the compiler. It's absolutely critical. We have to make sure they're, they're right and well tested, and they are well tested. And uh, they have to make sure they perform so that they can work well enough and so on. But that extra level support of having it in the IDE, I know how expensive IDE tooling is to maintain and, and deliver, and, and not everybody uses Visual Studio. We care even more about VS Code. Probably simply registering a VS Code basic regular expression based kind of um, uh, thing to give some colorization in VS Code. That's probably the, the simplest thing. But we're not going to deliver that as part of the Visual Studio tooling because you know it's only an internalized thing as far as the F Sharp compiler tooling is concerned. So please do it uh, if you if you can. The great thing about VS Code delivery of that stuff is, of course, you get the suggested tooling thing comes up in VS Code saying, hey, install this tool. You, I see you're using FS Lex. Go, go install this regular expression filter thing uh, for colorization. Um, it would also be useful to, to register that with GitHub if you, uh, if, if you want as, as a language thing, a supported file type for GitHub. But um, yeah, I, I'm. I, I, it's V. VS tooling is just quite expensive in a way to maintain those added tools to support your development experience. You can see that in the fact that that fscomp.txt file didn't automatically cause so re, you know, editing the file didn't cause things to populate through the IDE. It's an internal tool that we use, so we don't have full Visual Studio tooling for it. So, is it hard? Yeah. To add VS support for anything. It's kind of hard. Even if it's easy to do, it's just really hard to maintain over time uh, and hard to get the people using it who need to use it at the time they need to use it. You know, and to be honest, a lot of people don't even use Visual Studio. They use Emacs and other things when working on, compile on components down this low. Personally, I, I do use Visual Studio. It's, uh, yeah. Philip also said what you would have to do. But I guess my short answer is yes, it's hard. Uh, naive about compilers. Is there a pragmatic purpose to single letter obfuscated names? Okay, uh, just information density in the compiler, uh, I guess. Uh, now, the EF sharp compiler is too dense. Uh, uh, is it a deliberate decision to avoid type annotations? Covered that a bit. Not in some, the, the more you get into implementation only code, Yes, to increase information density and uh, code reviewability and so on, but um, we need more type annotations and we should improve that. Okay, uh, Vlad, do you want to call out another question? Um, sure. Uh, so, um, Vasily is asking that uh, how do you um, how do you think or like what do you think like if some bug fixes or minor features uh, can be uh, implemented or developed uh, by you know the, the 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 CS students as a part of the scientific work because universities have you know the compiler classes and and so on. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, if I was going to do a course on that, I think. Uh, I think you would 
it would be quite interesting to structure the course around both the Roslyn compiler and the F sharp compiler. Uh, in the sense that you would probably start with the Roslyn compiler. It is a very nice compiler in many ways and object orientation will be part of the course, but it's entirely reasonable to have a, you know, a good curriculum should also be teaching functional programming. And uh, why not also show the F sharp compiler as part of that curriculum? Yeah. And uh, you you would choose, uh, you, you would have to, the compiler is a, co is a complex thing, but it does build and you can add tests and you can guide people through what we did today. I don't know about fixing bugs because the problem is the bugs might already be fixed. And if they're easy enough to fix, then, you know, it only takes one student to go and fix the bug and then everyone has a solution and that sort of thing. Uh, the, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, the problem is yeah, you, when you do curriculum development material, you want it to stay stable over five years as well as you, as you deliver the course multiple times. And that's a little bit tricky in, um, in, in, in that kind of bug fixing or small feature development kind of work. So um, Will has actually been working on an, ide ide and sort of an ideal compiler, taking a lot of the lessons that have been uh, done through Roslyn and a lot of the lessons that have been done with F sharp and sort of making a mini language, a mini ideal compiler. And there's also Imo Landworth has excellent material on uh, writing a compiler for .NET. Uh, and that could also. So I think I would, you'd have to take a, you know, probably reduce things down to a much simpler language. There are these books like Modern Compiler Implementation in ML, Modern Compiler Implementation in Java. There might be some other similar things. Personally, I think it's important to update those. And to have a new, you could take the same mini language, but actually talk about doing IDE tooling as well. We haven't talked about IDE tooling much. We talked about when errors are reported. I haven't talked about the language service much. We can talk about that in future topics. But um, uh, yeah, a, a good modern introduction to compilers would include how to write compiler tooling. Now, um, Christoph Cheslek is absolutely insistent that the F sharp and C sharp tooling approach to tooling is some of the best in in terms of structure it's, it's, it's some of the best in the world because the one code base implements both the compiler and the compilation tooling it's actually quite a tight implementation it's complex it's got its problems but it is actually tight and that when we do think something like string interpolation or something in the f-sharp compiler or, or in Roslyn, it flows up through all the different tooling that is delivered for c-sharp and f-sharp and uh so I think you'd want to get that across to the students uh, is like, you know, if you're going to build a language and think about the language service right from the start yeah, and structure your whole thing around that view of the compiler as a service. OK. Uh, will these community sessions continue and can we suggest future topics? As, as we advertise this, this was just me and Vlad having a chat and we decided to open it up. And I, uh, I like the ad hoc formats in that kind of way, in that uh, we're not making a total promise that we're going to do it in one way or another. But I actually, it depends a bit on how much pressure we are under with regard to deadlines and, and teamwork and so on in order to make time for this sort of thing. I did start these kind of F sharp compiler um, uh, office hours for a while. That was good, but yeah, yeah, we'll do whatever we do for a while. Keep your eye out on Twitter. Keep your eye out on the community forums. And by all means, start your own versions of, of, of this as well if you dig into some particular areas. Uh, we do have the Dugnad sessions, uh, which everyone is will. Uh, I'd love people to get involved with. Uh, let me type in Dugnad F sharp here. We've had two of these so far, F sharp Dugnad community cleanup sessions. A lot of the topics, um, well, th 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 this is more general than the compiler, but the compiler, cleaning up the compiler, I'd love to have a few dugnads associated with that. A dugnad is a Norwegian word for cleaning up the neighborhood. And, you know, plenty of questions about why is the compiler messy and such and such in this dimension. Let's just clean it up. Let's just make it better and uh, do it as a community. And we can do that by getting together and doing that, either online or, or not. Uh, we can also just 
chat for a while, for half an hour, say hi to each other, and uh, and then go and do some work to clean it up. Or just talk about how we would like to clean it up, what we want for coding conventions, what we want for type annotations. You know, we own this code together, so we can make things better. Uh, so, okay. What is the biggest choice you'd make different with regard to the compiler and its architecture? I've touched on one of them, which is we didn't take this thing about invertibility seriously enough. You know, that I would have right from the start. There's this thing that happens in academic versions of, a, of compilation, which is that you throw a lot of information away right up front. You go from, I even call it an abstract syntax tree. It's not a concrete syntax tree. It's, it, it throws some information away. It, it, it abstracts. It just gets rid of all the comments. It get, gets rid of uh, if you've got a string literal, which is uh, over multiple lines and multiple fragments of that or something. It, get, it gets rid of that and puts it all into one string. Yeah, it, it does. It does a, gets rid of loads and loads of stuff. If you've got two language constructs which are kind of the same, it makes them into one thing and loses that. What were they originally? And that, you know, I came from a tradition in, in, in compiler writing, which threw a lot of information away. I wouldn't have done that. I would have known that right from the start not to do that. And that would have saved us a lot of trouble. Um, the other thing is this thing about the language service. I would have made it an incremental compiler from the start. At least as uh, I would have been writing it, you know, in the modern world, I'd probably just write it using the incremental um, uh, F sharp dot uh, data dot adaptive, for example, is an incremental on demand incremental compilation library that's quite lovely from F sharp. Uh, that lets you do all sorts of sort of mapping and folding over incremental data structures. Probably would have written it using that, and that would have been probably a lot better. Uh, someone saying thank you, that's very kind. Uh, and uh, we've gone two hours and I think covered all the questions. Did we miss any? I think so. I think I think these are all the questions. Yeah. Just to say we have a Russian Telegram uh, chat for F Sharp. There is a compiler channel on the F Sharp Slack. I'm not logged into Slack on this computer, so I can't show it. Uh, Vlad, I think you're on that channel. Maybe you could send the links around to that. Yeah. Uh, and we will, I guess, call it quits there. If there's any more questions, paste them in. But um, I'll hang around for a few minutes. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Next time we'll make it that we can have voice. I think it's nice to actually meet everyone on the computer, on the in the community, have a bit of a chat. Uh, and next time we'll probably do that. These are informal sessions, and it's great to have you all along. And Vlad, thank you too. Yeah, thanks for John. Okay. Cool. I'll just hang on to the call for a few minutes, and uh, and if there's any more questions, come on. Otherwise, we're done. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And I should say thank you to Lanax uh, for choosing the bug, for, picking, for doing the bug, and uh, for, yeah. Okay, cool. So I think no more questions. Oh, I'll have one new question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just oh. you know. People, people saying thank you. So okay. thanks a lot, folks, for for, right. for tuning in, and thanks to Don. All right. Love to see a session about why C sharp and F sharp don't play well together. Well, they do play well together by some standards, and they don't by other standards. They uh, the that's more a language design question. Uh, I think these sessions will be about compiler, but. Uh, the, if you could clarify what the question is and maybe pop it in, pop it in the FS Lang suggestions.
that might be uh, hang on so I can publish. Do I publish it? I press that. I see published. Uh, this one here. Why? The, yes. So, uh, so I say please post an issue. Okay. It's okay. Pop it in for slang suggestions, and we will eventually get round to to be more specific about what things you mean. And so please post that across in there. I'm not going to say I'll answer that straight away. I don't, I don't tend to read everything that goes through that repository, but I do eventually read all the issues and reply, and other people might reply to the issues there as well. I have another comment. Is there a sunsetting plan for Net472? Well, Philip would have been the one to answer that. Uh, yeah, there is. It doesn't resolve the double compilation. We actually have a pull request to get rid of the Net472 compiler of the. The problem is, uh, we need both the Net472 compiler and the Net5 .NET Core compiler, but uh, for we might eventually get rid of Net472, maybe somehow. But we do need them both. But the problem is really that. We we split that too low. The F# -sharp compiler private is being is a big one. It's the big di component, and it's being compiled for both. So uh, so there is a pull request. Maybe Will is going to Will's replying. Will oh. uh, the pull request to only use uh, .NET standard for net uh, F# -sharp .compiler private. And we'd like to get rid of fsharp.private for fsharp service altogether. It's a separate thing. Okay. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you um, see you next time. I'll see you online. <laughs>